message, I'm remembering a basketball game I played in high school, uh, Christian school very much like uh, FCA. And we were playing our rival on this one night and the stands were packed, see, bigger in life in my mind anyway. And uh, all four corners, there was people standing and there was, there was just no room barely to play the game on the court. And I, it got especially tense. And I remember even in a Christian you know, environment, there was a lot of the people yelling at the refs. And uh, a middle school boy got carried away in the spirit of the, the crowd, I, I'll never forget. And it was toward the end of the game and the, the ref was handing the ball to one of our players for an inbounds. And a, a middle school boy was in the corner standing up, just berating the ref, probably six feet away from him, just berating him with all his might. And finally the ref had enough. And so I'll never forget what he did. He took his whistle off and he put it over the head of this middle school boy, handed him the basketball and walked out of the gym. And we're all like, what? What do we do now? He ain't the ref. That's not gonna work. I'll never forget it. But it reminds me as we come back to a second week on the subject of financial giving sometimes, it reminds me how God is with us in the area of our money. He looks down, he sees us, it's a very personal thing because he's the blessing, he's the, the reason we have the wealth we have and all the good things in our life. And he sees us talking, carrying on, like, like we understand that area better than he does. And, and, we, and, and, and he finally just get, comes to the point where he says, you know what, you know so much about what you can spend and what you can't spend, You're, you just take over, you're in charge. It's your, it's your thing now. And of course that's ridiculous immediately because we can't bless our life we can't bless our money like he can. And, um, and so immediately we begin to experience no margin. We begin to, begin to not even know where our money's going. It becomes a source instead of uh, Thanksgiving, it becomes a source of tension and conflict. And, and that's often the way it goes when we fail to acknowledge him appropriately. And I, I'm talking this morning again, like last week to family. If you call FCC your church home, and you don't give at the 10% level of your income. That's always been the number. God could have picked 20, he could have picked 37, he could have picked two, but he picked the number 10 from the very beginning of the Bible and said, that's the percentage that shows me that you get that I'm the one that blesses you and you get my importance and you let me be in charge uh, of that area to make it a source of peace, a source of provision and a, and a source of overflowing thanksgiving and praise to me. God says, that's the number. And if you're not at that number, you can tell yourself whatever you want, but you're in charge. And so whatever's going on, it, it, it's symptomatic of a faith decision, of a, of a repenting and a believing decision that we all have to make to come back at least to the minimum, to the baseline that shows God he's important. Otherwise, we're insulting him. We're insulting to him if we just give less than that. So again, this isn't for those who are just visiting today, but if you're in the family, this is the second message uh, and we, we uh, have come to it in our study of the Sermon on the Mount and we've taken some more time on this specific subject. The Sermon on the Mount, as we were learning, is a comparison between religion and the kingdom of God. Religion in so many uh, forms is man-centered, man-powered, and man-exalting. And uh, uh, the kingdom of God uh, is a miracle immediately from Jesus and all the glory goes to him. As we enter the kingdom with Jesus in this great sermon, there, there's a whole new way of looking at sin. So we look completely differently at the sin of anger and the sin of lust and the sin of divorce and the sin of lying and the sin of retaliation. This is where we've been in the last few months. And then he begins to turn the corner and says, hey, you know what, and you're in the kingdom instead of religion, you begin to look differently at acts of righteousness, at, at good deeds as well. And so we look differently at, at uh, uh, fasting and praying and then also at financial giving, a whole new perspective. Well, we got to that point and we said, you know what, we're gonna take two extra weeks and we're gonna go into the epistles and see Paul, the apostle Paul, a converted Pharisee, a converted, a converted religious leader into the kingdom very dramatically, and how he begins to address one of his churches who he is asking to give and contribute to believers in Jerusalem who've had a famine and they're in need financially. And so he is sending his leaders, his deputies, to collect an offering from them in Corinth 
and they're going to take that offering to uh, brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And so when he was challenging about collecting this offering and giving, we see uh, what kingdom giving is like, not religious giving out of obligation, out of guilt, reluctant fundraising. No, no, this is kingdom giving. It's a miracle, and it goes, uh, it goes uh, to where our, our money is transformed uh, by God. And this is such an important, powerful area. We've got to get it right. We've got to have our money go into the kingdom and not stay in religion, not stay back. We need to excel in the grace of giving. And this is where uh, we pick up. This is where we were last week. We saw six um, ways that kingdom giving is different from religious giving. And now we pick back up. This is a, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, the second one, 2 Corinthians. And we're picking it back up for three more things that are true about kingdom giving. Again, the same passage as last week. And then we're going to be challenged to make a commitment. So three more things we'll see that are true if we're getting our money as it comes into the kingdom and is a miracle and we trust Jesus for his glory and we see that being blessed at a whole new level than religion. And so we pick it back up and we'll be reading the scripture for under each point. So for the first point, um, kingdom giving proves our love. Kingdom giving proves our love. And now we're looking in 2 Corinthians now at verses 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians verses 8 and 9. Uh, chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. Paul says, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. He's talking about the Macedonian believers who had been so generous and he's comparing it and saying to the believers in Corinth, look at them. Look how much they really love the other brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Look at the amount they gave even out of their poverty and even in their crisis, their trial that they're going through. And so compare yourself. This is a very objective way to compare how much do you really love God and love other brothers and sisters in the kingdom. Uh, that's what Paul's talking about here. And then again in verse 24, chapter 8, Paul says, therefore show these men, he's talking about the men that he's sending to collect the offering, therefore show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it, so that the churches can see it. Do you love God? Do you love other people, his people? Couldn't be anything more important, that's the first. And the second greatest commandment, to love God and to love your neighbor. Do you, do we, do I? You can measure it by your money. You can measure it by how much your financial giving shows that, yes, my heart is where my treasure is, is with God and his people. Because this is what I've learned, and I think you'll acknowledge this is true. We give freely and cheerfully to the things we love, don't we? Something in your life you love, grandchildren, we can start with that. My wife's uh, very frugal, and then we had grandkids. Oh my gosh, we have no more money. <laughs> She's cleaned out the toy section in all, every store in Lancaster before we go down to Mississippi and see our grandkids, because she freely gives to the things she loves. But how about our hobbies? How about our house, our cars, and whatever you're into? all the things uh, that we love. We're not reluctant, we're not careful. Vacations, things that we love, we cheerfully give our money to anything we love. And there's nothing wrong with this, but I'm just asking the question by the same rule, do you love God and do you love his people? And whatever the answer to that is, we have to accept that as a test. Do I, because that's the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. And do I love God and other people? I don't know. Let me really check that out in an objective way. Let me see. Well, do I give freely of my money to God and, and cheerfully of my money to God and his people? That will tell you that's a proof of your love. This is what Paul's talking about. And this was true all through the Bible. We're very familiar with these main characters in the Bible. King David. He proved his love for God. He wrote all those Psalms and his love for God's people as he was the greatest king Israel ever had. When he contributed 100 metric tons of gold and 240 metric tons of silver from his own wealth for the temple that his son Solomon would build. 
When Zacchaeus, a crooked tax collector, uh, met Jesus and his life was completely changed, you know what he did? He gave half of his possessions to the poor. And he gave four times the amount back to the people he had cheated. And Jesus said, truly today, salvation has come to this house. It was a test. And all, oh my gosh, he didn't grow to that. He immediately showed his love for God, Jesus who had changed him, and his love for God's people that he had cheated. And the people who were poor and needy, he passed the test right away and showed he really was filled with love for God and for Jesus who had just changed his life. Mary, Mary of Bethany, Lazarus' sister, Martha's sister, took a pint of pure nard worth a year's wages and poured it on Jesus' feet soon before he died. Around this time of year, we'll be celebrating. And uh, wiped uh, Jesus' feet with her hair and the whole house was filled with the fragrance of this sacrificial gift for Jesus to prepare him for his burial. The disciples who followed Jesus gave up their businesses, eventually their lives. The early believers sold land and houses and brought the proceeds to the apostles so they could be distributed for any who had need because they genuinely loved each other in the church. They had fellowship and family and they were committed. It was real. That's why it exploded and, and grew to reach the whole world because it passed the test of financial generosity to prove love for God, for Jesus, for his people. Let's be honest about the results of this test for a moment. If you're giving a token to God, I must tell you, you have a token God. And that's more serious than a financial issue. If you're giving the leftovers to God, then guess what? Your God is a leftovers God. And I'm just telling you, Jesus is not a leftovers God. He's a first fruits God. He's a God we would delight to give our best. And I want that God for you because that's the God who exists. He's that good. Our God is that good. He's worthy of our best. He's not a leftovers token God. And money doesn't lie. It's a reliable test. Do we love him? Do we get him? Are we really experiencing him? This is more serious than even just money. Kingdom giving proves our love. Second, kingdom giving sets the tone. Sets the tone. Now we go back to the passage now in chapter 9, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 12 through 15. Paul says, This service that you perform, speaking of the offering they're contributing to the believers in Jerusalem, is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts, now the recipients in Jerusalem, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Sets the tone. This is speaking of the kingdom atmosphere, which is supercharged by giving all starting with Jesus, God's greatest gift to us. And from there, we begin to receive, and then we begin to give like that, and it just fills the atmosphere. And, and this is what Paul's saying. You're not just meeting the needs in Jerusalem. It's like you're making this whole thing matter, and, and so they're not just going to have the money they need to buy food and, and necessities. They're going to overflow with thanksgiving, and they're going to cause you're going to cause them to praise God, and then they're going to pray for you. They're going to pray back to you. You have supported them, and their hearts will go out to you when they pray. It won't be dry. It won't be uh, out of obligation and reluctant and rote and all those other religious words. No, it's going to be... Uh, a tone of excitement and energy and blessing and grace. So I've been in the religious world all my life. Dad was a minister and I came up and had the same vocation. And so I've been in religious activities and religious circles, church services, Sunday school classes, small groups, Christian school, missionary work, leadership teams, even weddings and funerals, you name it, religious gatherings. And there's one way to judge all of them, and that's atmosphere. Am I right? Atmosphere. 
So I can tell you, and we probably could all admit this because we all have been in religious services and gatherings, that uh, if it's religion and not the kingdom, it has a certain repressive atmosphere, doesn't it? It's an atmosphere of um, sort of uh, burdensome, non-inspiring. That's why a lot of people quit church. It's why they quit synagogue and they quit uh, the temple wherever they go, wherever they're experiencing uh, church, they drop out. And why is it that atmosphere? Um, deeply flawed people are making a futile attempt to improve themselves and they gather together and they know that it's not working and they know that it's not helping. And so the only reason they'll come is out of obligation and guilt. And the only reason that doesn't last very long, they finally figure it out and they stop doing it. Why would I come here? This isn't helping me. This is a, an atmosphere uh, that, that the only joy and the only celebration is, is if it's orchestrated and it's the low point of the week to come. And um, we can contrast that then to the kingdom of God. If you want to know the difference between religion and the kingdom of God in a group and a church, you can just check out the atmosphere. Because when people gather in a kingdom setting, there's an atmosphere of enthusiasm that lasts for years and years. People become, they come because they want to come. It's the high point of the week. It's not burdensome to them. It's empowering to come. And here's why, and I'll distinguish that for you because I've noticed this and the reason in a religious atmosphere, it's so simple. You can, you can summarize the experience by the simple word do, D-O, do. That's the theme. We find out each week something else that we've got to do. We need to do more. We're proud of what we do. We're ashamed of what we don't do. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. That's religion. Come on, do, do, do. And we're, we know we're sinners. We know we're failing. We know that we have an evil propensity and we know that we've struggled all week and we're weak and needy and we come together and it's more do, 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 do. And people are like, oh, I'm sad enough. I'm sick of it. And they look around for something. Go, what is this? Well, in the kingdom, the key word is not do, it's done. We constantly talk about what God has done done for us and what Jesus has done for us when he died on the cross and so many other acts of grace and it takes the burden off us and it brings hope that we can change because of what God has done and it makes all the difference it gives us then the capacity to do it gives us the capacity to give but the thing that keeps us going and keeps inspiring us is this. And this is what Paul says he, at the end of his talk about how the, their gift will, will, will create this, set this tone and create this atmosphere. He said, and thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, which set the tone from the very beginning. He gave the most generous gift ever. And when we come and celebrate that, it just infuses our atmosphere, infuses this kingdom that we're in, this gathering with, with joy and, and with grace. I want to say... Again, to family, when I talk specifically to you about financial giving, if you get Jesus, you get a capacity to give and you begin to give like that, that will make our future so much more joyful together for you, for me. If you're in and you say, this is my future as long as God's willing and I'm here in town, this is where I come to connect with other believers and experience Jesus and worship, then I wanna say, I want this church and I want this church for me and Lynn to be a church filled with generous givers because it sets the tone every time someone makes a sacrifice. It fills the whole church with the fragrance. Can you imagine the majority giving, like right now the 30% are giving, if the other 70 gave, even at just that level? And then if we all moved on from the baseline, can you imagine the provision, the joy, the excitement, the funding of so many things we could do, we could experience, we could be proud of, we could say, look, we're passing the test. This is a real church. Look at all we're able to do. Uh, the, the blessed future that I see for us includes that, and I want that for us, all of us, who call FCC home. And we can get it from God who gave us Jesus. And Jesus who gave himself. And then when we get that, that capacity, and then we give, we give always more, always more. Kingdom giving, not religious giving. 
It proves our love. It sets the tone. And then finally, kingdom giving brings God's reward. And this is the part, if you get this point, where there's this phrase embedded that God loves a cheerful giver, not one who gives out of reluctance and obligation. And I'll tell you, if you get this point, you'll give with a smile. You won't give because somebody talked you into it and you feel bad for a year and then you finally quit. You'll give from your own heart and you'll think it's the best deal in the world. And I'll have hooked you up or someone or you yourself and your faith will have hooked up with a God very person he looks down at you and says I'll reward you do you get that look at the verses here I'm not making this up this is the strongest place in the Bible that pre presents this second Corinthians again chapter 9 now verses 6 and 7 remember this whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly this is God's Word and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, it's funny, the things we do to get people to give, and I'm not against them, I think it's great, it's creative, and it's, so public radio, they're trying to get you to support it, and they'll give you a classic CD collection of the Carpenters. Shows a little about the age of the supporters of public radio. I don't mind. Crosby, Stills, and Nash now, that's AARP material. It's just hard to believe. But they'll give you a CD back. You come uh, to our carnival soon uh, uh, for FCA, and you can go to a silent auction and not just give money to the school, which is a great cause. You can actually purchase a donated item and then enjoy whatever that item is. But you know, there's still always the business side of us that says, you know, those CDs, that's really great to get something. I could have bought three of them with that money. Right? And yet still, it seems to be a motivator for people to have some tangible thing back. And it just reminded me this week, for kingdom giving, what do we get back? It's not from the recipient of our gift. Take it out of the financial area for a moment. When you're in your marriage and you're looking at your spouse, maybe you're a little disappointed and you look, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, you look at them and you think, if I gave you what you want, would I get what I want back? I don't know. I'm not sure if you were even capable of that. I'm not sure you would change very fast, no matter what I did. And so I'm wondering, would I get that from you if I sowed to you the things you want? Would I reap back the things I want? And God's like, why are you looking at them? They're not the field. He's like, this promise of sowing and reaping, he's like, I made that promise to you. Look at me, this is between you and me. The fertile field that you sow in is the field of my promise, the field of my faithfulness. You give to them, don't look to them, don't hope in them. I'm watching everything that you do, every effort you make, every dollar you give. And I'm telling you, look at me, what you sow, you will reap. You sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. You sow generously, you'll reap generously. This is your Father in heaven. This is your God talking. It's a wonderful motivation for giving. And, and this is just the beginning. Look at verse 8. Look at how God, is, does this sound iffy? Does this sound reluctant on God's part? Listen, verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I counted them, that's three alls and an every and the words abound and abundantly. And that should be our focus. So much rides on our ability to believe that. I'm, I'm suffocating in my heart at the weight of blessing in this room that will come as we each individually believe this and begin to sow more generously and then reap more generously from our heavenly father who gave us salvation. I'm, I'm suffocating with what's at stake, not just for those of us who would give at a basic level, but those of us who begin to go beyond that and actually according to the kingdom, be, be really giving in a generous way. And then God's like, give more and I'll give you more back. I'll give you even more. You like what you have from me? Hey, take it and sow generously, and I'll give you even more. You want more? Give. Give generously, and according to the way you sow what I've given you, I will give you 
You will reap generously. That's a prompt. Each one of us needs to hear that as a whisper from our Heavenly Father gets through to us and we're like, oh, nothing is stopping this. There is no limit from any place where I'm giving or, or loving or making efforts to sow. The field is God and he will give to me back in the way that I give. Extremely motivating. And it applies specifically to money. In this context, it's the money that they're giving to the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who are suffering because of a famine causes them to give cheerfully, not under compulsion, which are huge religious, not reluctantly or under compulsion, which are huge religion words. What a deal. Well, we come to the conclusion then, and the simple word here I'm gonna say, that I've been led by God for the whole two weeks to say at the end of this series, is the word is jump. I believe God is telling me to tell you that what you need to do is jump. It's a fearful thing. It's a very fearful thing. Even to come to the next level or the basic level of giving, uh, we need to make the jump. I got this from Bill Hybels, pastor of Willow Creek Community Church, his latest book, Simplify, which I highly recommend. He describes a scenario between two men, or contrast, Jim and Mike. Jim and Mike. Now, Jim is first. And Jim thinks he needs 100% of his income to make it from point A to point B. It's simple math represents a whole lot of people. I need all my money to accomplish my goals. <laughs> There's no leftovers, so to get from A to B, I need 100%, okay, that's Jim. Mike, he says, I believe God's word that he can get me from A to B with 90% of my income, and I'll give 10% back to him and support his work. And as a reward, God will not only take me from point A to point B, but he'll take me from point B to point C. Point C represents his overwhelming blessings. Now, point C is not even on the first guy, not even on Jim's radar. Point C, what is that? My whole thing is just his whole roadmap ends at B. But Mike sees point C described in the Bible as a place of unpredictable blessing and favor. He's not sure what it's gonna be like, but he knows that it's definitely more exciting and rewarding than ending his journey at point B. Now here's the crazy thing, here's the interesting thing. Both Jim and Mike think that the other guy is an idiot. Okay, the first guy, Jim, he thinks Mike's an idiot to believe he can get from A to B with 90% of his income, right? Okay, it's just not possible can't be done. Mike, the second guy, thinks Jim is an idiot because the most he can accomplish is getting to point B, which stands for big deal and boring. Jim will never experience the joy of the journey from B to C, God's supernatural blessing in his financial life and many other areas of his life. Everyone who has ever obeyed God's command to give the tithe has amazing point C stories, answered prayers, favor, protection, new friendships, new opportunities, unexpected blessings. Obeying God from point A to point B while anticipating the next point C story is the only way to live. Sign me up for the B to C life. The first tenth of my income goes to God by faith. Now, I wanna just be very personal with you. I'm your spiritual leader, I've gotta say this to you, and I've said it to myself, God has said it to me. If you're sitting out there today and you think giving 10% of your income to God would be impossible and even irresponsible, then from my heart, I must tell you, you'll be saying the same thing in a year or even 10 years, it's extremely likely you'll say the same thing all the way home to heaven. And yet this is a baseline, a minimum when it comes to kingdom giving and the adventure that we've been describing and all that you could be experiencing. It's just first grade, it was introduced in Genesis in the Old Testament, now it's a new covenant, a new spirit, new provision, new expectation. 
and you're not even at the baseline, and you'll stay that way, stuck. So I don't hesitate to say this. We do not gradually progress to this level of giving. We get to this level by repenting and believing and looking God straight in the face and saying, you are the source of every good thing in my life. Here is the appropriate acknowledgement of that from me, from my money, the money that you have blessed me with. Now, God takes this very personally because he looks down, he sees the truth. He's blessed you and he's like, you just keep leaving me out. You just got it all figured out, don't you? He knows the truth. And I'll ask you this, how do you know your financial inability to tithe isn't because of God? That's not gonna get better until you start acknowledging him appropriately. Well, um, I wanna end just with a story that we uh, experienced a few years ago. I was in um, Nicaragua, we had a relationship in Virginia Beach, our church there, Grace Bible Church, with a, a church in Rio Blanco in the rainforest in Nicaragua. And uh, every time we would go, we enjoyed hiking uh, the uh, two or three hours into the rainforest, and there was a really big waterfall, beautiful waterfall. We would get there and we'd swim. And I remember the first time I hiked in, I looked up to the waterfall, and I, I thought, wow. And then some people said, you know what, you can climb up these rocks. and but, but if you do, there's no way down. They're too steep, you can't come back down. The only way down when you get up there is you have to jump off into the pool. I'm like, forget it, absolutely forget it. I'm scared of heights, I get dizzy, uh, I get nauseated. Um, so there was no way, I just swam in the pool and we saw a few people being brave, jumping off the waterfall. Well, on another trip, I made a second hike to the waterfall. And this time, when we got to the pool, looked up at the waterfall, the Nicaraguan believers told me, they said, your daughter, in the broken English, they said, your daughter, your daughter here a month ago, she jumped, she jumped, she jumped from top. Ba baby daughter? Yeah, yeah, my baby daughter, Jessie, she did. Okay, now I gotta go. I gotta go. So, um, I climbed up the rocks, and uh, sure enough, I sealed my fate. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, it started getting really scary. Got white in the face, started getting nauseated, started shaking, heebie-jeebies, right? I mean, because I believe God promises, lo, I am with you always, not high, right? You like that? You, yeah, yeah, that's me. All right, so I get up there. So I get up there, and I'm sitting right behind, the guy in front of me is the son of the head missionary, the founding missionary of like 13 churches, and he'd been our guide the whole time. He'd been talking the language, knew the culture well, and he gets on that slippery rock, stands up, gets ready to jump, and he freezes. And I'm sitting right behind him, getting ready to go next. And I remember thinking to myself while I was watching him, that is not gonna happen to me because it just got worse and worse. And all the people down in the pool were yelling up to him, encouragements, none of, there wasn't anything anybody could say to him that would matter. He, the longer he put it off, the more he was paralyzed by his fear to jump. So, event, so the whole time in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, when he, whatever he does, whenever I'm getting up there, I am going, like going, jumping. And uh, so he eventually moved out of the way and I stepped up on the slippery rock and I looked down, there was the pastor who had hosted me a number of times in his country, who had led the hike, who was down in the pool looking up in his broken English, Sergio Torres, a man I had grown to love and trust. And he just looked at me and he said, Dean, Jean, Jean, Dean. And he held his arms out. And I remember I just smiled and I just went right off the cliff. And I'll never forget splashing in the water and not dying. 
and I swam back to the surface and I was insufferably excited for the whole rest of the day. I would not shut up. In fact, I coached that missionary's kid down from the ledge. I mean, I coached him to jump. It took a 30 minutes, but still, I was, I was like a U.S. SEAL now, man. I'm like, hey, Navy SEAL, baby, come on, do it like I did. Yeah, it's nothing. He jumped. And uh, I'll just never forget that lesson. And I thought of that this week. I thought, you know, you don't need another sermon. Those of you who don't give, who don't tithe, even the basic level, it's fear. You need to look at me. You need to look at so many others, simple, like you, n nothing to our credit, who have made the jump and loved it. Trust God, trust his word, and make the jump. He'll help you overcome your fear, and then he will bless you in your money. Oh, oh with all my heart. We said it last week, and we'll say it again. We want you to cross that line. We want you to do that by just writing new tither on the Connect at Grace form. Don't put your name. This is between you and the Heavenly Father, but we want to pray for you, and we want you to make that decision to write it down. You could do it today. You could do it after you talk with your spouse, your family, whatever, but don't put it off. In the end, jump, jump, and um, so write, your, write, write just new tither down. And if you're already tithing, we, we don't need to hear from you. Thank you so much. But this is just specific challenge, again, to the 70% of us who love this church but aren't giving at that level. I challenge you, write that on the card. Turn it in. Make the jump. We'll rejoice together. You'll be nuts. You'll be crazy. And... Um, and then we make the guarantee. Uh, Lenny Potochnik, our CFO, is making the guarantee. And this is between you and him. You don't have to tell me or any other pastor. In six months, if you're not cheerful about what you've given, we'll give it all back. We'll refund it to you. We mean that because we believe in it so much that we'll take all your money. And if you gave it and you say, oh, it's like religion, I I'm feel compulsed, I feel talked in, I feel like it was fundraising, I wish I had it back, it was a loss for me, we'll give it all back for you. We mean that without any question. Um, but I, I pray that God will lead our church into a future that's blessed by his um, generosity coming through each one of us. Would you bow your heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for calm in the face of fear. <laughs> and um, right now I just pray for your spirit to give us that, that generosity, that freedom. I pray right now many would jump in their heart and experience your freedom, your peace financially, an exciting uh, future for our church, all that will happen. Bless us now as we worship you and remember Jesus who gave everything for us. For it's in his name we pray, amen.